Let's pray, we'll dedicate the offering and ask the Lord's help as we come to his word. Father, thank you uh, for every good thing you give us. Uh, thank you for all of life that is from your hands. Lord, help us to use all you've given us well for the glory of Jesus and accept these offerings we bring. Uh, Lord, that you may um, uh, use them to advance his kingdom where we are, even as you use us. And Father, as we come to your word today, we pray that you would be speaking into our hearts. Lord, draw us to faith in Jesus. Uh, Lord, may uh, we not only acknowledge that there is uh, a resurrection and life, but may we embrace Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, in faith, in trust, in obedience, so that our future is entirely tied up with his. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. Well, death is a, a part of life, or, or so they say. Um, sometimes life is long, sometimes it's short. Uh, one thing is certain, death eventually comes to everyone. Uh, you probably experience it comes to people close to us. It impacts on our lives and one day it will visit each of us too. Uh, when I exited uh, Bible college and uh, went to my first parish in Nura, uh, I had a phone call about my first funeral before I had even officially started. Uh, and there have been countless funerals since. Funerals for old, funerals for young people killed in motor accidents, funerals for Christians, funerals for people who have had no faith, funerals for people I didn't know, funerals for people I knew well, and was at their bedside when they died. I've seen people deal with loss and death in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, seeing them deal with it with loud sobbing and, and with denial, uh, or perhaps you may often see at a funeral people emotionally distancing themselves as a form of self-protection. But I don't think anyone would truly say death is just a part of life. It's not. It's not. Death is an intruder. Death is a spoiler. Uh, deep down, we recognise that, don't we? So that's why we, we look to things to give us pleasure in the days that we have, because we, we know um, death is not meant to be there. Life is meant to be something other than that. Or we in, invest ourselves um, in... Uh, 
gym memberships or, or health supplements or, or whatever it may be, to prolong life. A and in each of us, I think there is uh, a whisper of a longing that death is not the end. There is a longing. Everyone has. The death is not the end. Now we, we come to John 11 and we come to Jesus' claim, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, at Jesus' command, uh, a man who is very dead, Lazarus, walks out of a tomb. You know, it's, it's not something that we kind of take lightly and, and maybe we think, well, that's just one of those things that happens every now and again. You know, it, it, it just doesn't. Uh, I've spoken uh, of the hope of resurrection at, I think, at every funeral I've conducted. But I've never yet had anyone bang on a coffin from the inside yelling, let me out. It just doesn't happen. So when John, as an eyewitness, says he saw a resurrection uh, and it wasn't just John. It was a whole crowd of people who were, were there as well uh, who also saw it, including those who did not believe in Jesus. They saw it too. Then we need to take notice of what John tells us and we need to consider what it means for us. But before we consider what Jesus' claim to be the resurrection and the life means for us, we need to understand why there is death. Uh, and so we go back right to the start, to the opening chapters of the Bible, uh, and we find there that the very first people, Adam and Eve, as they were created by God, they could have lived forever. They didn't have to die. That God didn't make them uh, with a built-in expiry date. They, they, they just had one command to obey. Uh, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Jesus, God created them to, to live forever, but there was a, a test of their love and their devotion to him. There was a command that they had to keep. Uh, a deathless existence, you see, was already theirs right at the very beginning, and it would have remained that way had they obeyed God. It wasn't a, an onerous command they were given. You know, maybe we can picture it this way. Picture a feast. Uh, a, a huge smorgasbord of all the very best food is laid out and you can eat as much of you as you like of anything you like apart from what's on one plate. Everything else is enough to gorge yourself on and to, to fully satisfy you. But here is Adam and Eve. Along comes Satan. Uh, Satan, who was uh, a glorious creation of God, an archangel, who then rebelled against God as he, he thought that he was better suited to being a ruler than a servant. And so, so he sought to spoil God's 
perfect world by convincing Adam and Eve to think the same way he did, to think that they are better off as rulers than servants. And so Satan cast doubt on God's word and he cast doubt on God's goodness. And you can imagine the scene in the Garden of Eden. Uh, There's more than just a little bit of FOMO going on here. Uh, Adam and Eve, if they ate from the tree, their eyes would be opened and they would be like God. And during this chat with Satan, how Adam and Eve thought and felt about God changed. How they thought and they felt about God changed. Truth was undermined by a part lie. Suspicion displaced trust. Ambition pushed aside devotion. Uh, And so Adam and Eve made a choice and they ate and all creation was spoiled. The death that God had warned about was now theirs. Uh, Physical death, the days of their life on earth were now numbered. And spiritual death, There was broken fellowship with God and we read in Genesis 3 how they had fear and shame in God's presence rather than delight. And there's a great chasm, if you like, opened up between them and God that they couldn't get over, but only God could bridge. And so physical and spiritual death are part, a natural part of our existence too. And death comes to all. Death death is the intruder that spoils. But as we see in this passage, death does not have the final word. The one who has the final word is the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life. Well, Lazarus became gravely ill. Um, Lazarus lived at uh, Bethany, um, a town just uh, across the Kidron Valley on the, the Mount of Olives outside Jerusalem. He lived there with his sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus knew them well. Uh, It seems from reading the Gospels that they were perhaps a little bit like an extended family. Uh, They were among Jesus' disciples and Jesus loved them dearly. When Lazarus became sick, his sisters sent for Jesus to come and help them, to help Lazarus. But Jesus didn't rush right over, um, straight away. Instead, he stayed where he was for another two days. Uh, I wonder how confusing that must have been for the disciples, that Jesus didn't respond, but he just stayed on. Uh, And how distressing it must have been for Mary and Martha as they looked out for for Jesus to be coming along the road but he didn't come and then Lazarus died Jesus eventually turned up after Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days four days And Martha meets him with the words, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Perhaps there's a note of rebuke in her words, or at least disappointment. 
But her faith is not undone. Uh, Her faith remains. And so she says to Jesus, But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Lord, you weren't here. And he died. But I know even now, even now, after he's been in the grave for four days, I know God will give whatever you ask. And Jesus replied to her, Your brother will rise again. You see, Jesus knew all along what he planned to do. Jesus' delay was to set a scene for Uh, a resurrection that would give certainty to his disciples' faith and and would point them to Jesus himself as the source of life and the conqueror of death. And so Jesus explained to Martha plainly, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Notice Jesus' words to Martha. He he didn't say to her, I can give life and I can resurrect people. Just as Jesus didn't say, Um, I can give you light, but said, uh, I am the light of the world. Just as Jesus didn't say, "I I can open the door for you to pass through, but said, I am the door. So he says to Martha here, I am the resurrection and the life. Matt Carter and Josh Redberg in their commentary say, our hope is not in an event, resurrection, but in a person, Jesus. Friends, we don't need what Jesus can give so much as we need Jesus himself. Let me say that again because it's important. We don't need so much what Jesus can give us as we need Jesus himself. And so Jesus here redirects Martha from an abstract belief in a resurrection of the last day to a concrete, personal trust in him with the words, I am the resurrection and the life. And then Jesus gave a practical demonstration by raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus commanded the stone be taken away And then he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Friends, what does this mean for us? What does it mean for us? How is Jesus the resurrection and the life for us? Well, Jesus is the one who undoes the consequences of sin. Jesus is the one who undoes physical and spiritual death. Jesus is the one in whom we find life both now, fullness of life, different life, 
now as we live on earth and also life beyond the grave. Uh, And this life is not something that Jesus hands out to passers-by. It's it's something that is only had in relationship with him. It's not something you get from him. Uh, you, You get Jesus and you get life as well. You see, to have life, you must have Jesus. To not have Jesus is to not have life. Now, Jesus isn't like the the guy giving away boxes of Domino's pizza at the train station. What he offers is himself. He gives himself. I am, he says, the resurrection and the life. And as amazing as it was, the raising of Lazarus from the dead wasn't the main event. It was just the curtain raiser to what was about to happen. When when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, he knew what soon lay before him. God the Son who who was there at creation, who John tells us in the prologue to his gospel in chapter 1 and verse 4, he, he tells us that in him was life and that life was the light of men. That, that Jesus who was there at creation giving life was about to go to the cross and lay down his life. For sinners, as um, Carter and Redberg comment, he joins our pain, he enters our grief before he exiles it. You see, on the cross, Jesus bore God's wrath and he satisfied God's justice by carrying our death penalty, taking it on himself. And there at the cross, he not only paid for our sin, but he undid the curse of sin. He defeated Satan, the author of sin. And Jesus at the cross crushed death by rising to life Because, as Peter says, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And as that still lay ahead, conscious of what he was about to accomplish, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's a question we have to answer too, isn't it? It's a question for each of us. Do you believe this? Not just intellectually, not just to acknowledge that, yeah, Jesus must have risen from the dead, there's plenty of evidence for it. But do you believe it in a way that fills your heart with joy And with hope, as you face the circumstances of your life day by day and whatever tomorrow might bring, miracles themselves don't produce faith. We see that clearly in this passage and in the next chapter. A resurrection will never ensure that someone believes. 
In fact, if you read on into chapter 12 and verse 10, uh, the chief, for the chief priest, the resurrection was uh, an inconvenience and so they made plans to kill Lazarus afterwards. He died, Jesus raised him up. That's inconvenient for us, let's kill him. But in his gracious work, you see, people won't believe just because there's a resurrection. But in the gracious work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit convinces us about Jesus and he gives us the faith to believe in Jesus, to believe he is the resurrection and the life, the true life is found in him life now and life eternally. Martha said to Jesus in verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming, who is co coming into the world. How wonderful it must have been to have that certainty of Jesus' words, I am the resurrection and the life, ingrained deep into her mind and heart as she faced the days and years ahead. I'm going to speculate a little bit here. I wonder if upon seeing the risen Jesus, Martha echoed in her heart, Yes, Lord, Yes, Lord, you are the resurrection and the life. I wonder if upon seeing, uh, as she faced the years ahead, we don't know what happened to Martha, but we can imagine the joy that bubbled up in her heart in the warmth of Christian fellowship and seeing others come to Christ and faith in him. Uh, and perhaps how Jesus' words, I am the resurrection and the life, anchored her soul as, the pos as she possibly lived through the hard times of person persecution that broke out against the Jerusalem church. And yes, she and Mary and Lazarus, uh, they would all still die but she also had the certainty of Jesus' words that everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. You see, that day in Bethany, Jesus shifted Martha's focus from an abstract belief in resurrection on the final day to a personal hope in Jesus himself who is the resurrection and the life. Friends, is that true for you? Is that true for you? How do you answer the quest, Jesus' question? Do you believe this? Perhaps you face advancing years comes to all of us. Uh, is Jesus so real to you that even with failing eyes or diminishing strength or mounting struggles that seem to grow with each passing day, is Jesus so real that you your hope and your joy is not diminished. Yes, you have a growing desire to be with Jesus, but your life even now is filled with a gracious testimony to his faithfulness. And so you delight to speak of him. And his character is seen in your life as he has been 
transforming you. And it's obvious that he is a constant presence in your life. And even as you face the closing years, the Holy Spirit brings home the truth of Jesus' words even more sharply. I am the resurrection and the life. Younger Christians, perhaps the joy of finding new life in Jesus is relatively fresh. You, you don't know what the future holds. It's an un, increasingly uncertain world. Your faith is, it seems, is becoming more and more unacceptable in the public square. Perhaps it's getting harder in the workplace. But do you know that the one who simply said, Lazarus, come out, and with those words, Lazarus's lifeless heart began to beat again and blood began to pump through his arteries. The one whose voice alone was enough to reignite the synapses in Lazarus' brain and to rewind the decay of his bodily tissue You know him who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who brought Lazarus from the dead is the same one who holds the circumstances of your life, who dwells in you through the Holy Spirit and says to you, I am the resurrection and the life. With all that that means for now and for eternity, you see, Jesus is not something. Jesus is everything. So live close to him. Speak the gospel to yourself often. Maintain a tender conscience. Walk prayerfully, serving him in the courage that the Holy Spirit gives and knowing he is the one who is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life. And he is the one who is ultimately sovereign over the grave. Perhaps, perhaps, you're undecided about Jesus. You may, you may accept the Bible as true, but maybe you're still holding on to life the way that you want to live it. You acknowledge Jesus. Perhaps you're, you're even prepared to say, Jesus is the Son of God. But maybe you don't yet know him personally, relationally. You don't know him practically. If that's the case, hear Jesus' words. I am the resurrection and the life. True life, life with meaning and purpose, life with direction, life to the full as God created it to be, is found in him, in him only. In him only is eternal flourishing. Uh, you can look elsewhere. Maybe right now you, you're searching for meaning uh, and try as hard as you might what you think and explore to bring you happiness try many things but happiness still lies outside of your reach 
or, or maybe you get what you want only to find that it's, you're still not satisfied. Friends, that, that job, that promotion, that special someone, money, leisure, it can't and it never will satisfy your soul. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy your soul and the reason is that you are created by God to find your satisfaction in Jesus. When you find that everything else, everything else leaves you disappointed, everything else leaves you worn out, weary and hungry, Jesus says, and we saw it a couple of weeks ago in John 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the one who gives abundant life. So if you're undecided, maybe it's time to make a decision. Ask Jesus to show himself to you and to give you the life that he alone can give. And when you ask Jesus to reveal himself and to show you truth, if you're genuinely seeking the answer, he will not fail to give it. He will answer you. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? His words are a call to us to relationship with him. And he speaks those words to you now question is, do you believe? Will you now start to live every day of this life and eternity on the bedrock of that truth? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Will you rest every day your whole existence, everything in relationship with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you that Jesus tells us, I am the resurrection of the life. He then raised Lazarus from the tomb. But the greater resurrection was to come when he himself would go to the cross to die for our sin and conquering and crushing death, he would rise from the tomb himself having paid the penalty of sin. the one who is the author of life and has all life in him. And he freely gives life to all who will believe. Jesus' words, uh, I am the resurrection and the life are not, a, are not a call to some kind of intellectual acknowledgement although that's part of it. But more than that, it's a call to relationship. 
Father, may those words that spoke such hope to Martha and gave her certainty, may they spark hope and certainty in us too through the work of the Holy Spirit as we know Jesus as our Saviour and Lord and know that he has undone the curse of death And so life is found in relationship with him. Father, give us that certainty. Whether this is new or whether this we've walked with Jesus for many years, give us this certainty as the bedrock of our lives day by day. that we may delight in him and delight in the certain hope that we will have life with him forever. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.